Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Medal of Honor induction ceremony in honor of Colonel Paris D. Davis. Colonel Davis was presented our nation's highest and most prestigious award for valor by the President of the United States, the Medal of Honor. This afternoon, he will formally be inducted into the Pentagon's most sacred place, the Hall of Heroes. Our official party for today's ceremony includes the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Kathleen H. Hicks, the Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Christine E. Warmouth, the Chief of Staff of the Army, General James C. McConville, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael A. Grinston. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Staff Sergeant Maya Rodriguez from the United States Army Band, Pershing Zone, and the invocation delivered by Chaplain William Green, Deputy Chief of Chaplains. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. The words of the warrior King David echoes through the corridors of time, and they are no less true today than they were when David first prayed them over 3,000 years ago. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as we mark this special occasion with prayer to the God who continues to sustain the warrior's soul. Lord, I thank you for Colonel Paris D. Davis and for your presence in his life as he has answered your call to selfless and daring leadership. His life has been marked by heroism and true allegiance to our country and army. He rightly represented the 5th Special Forces Group Legion and his acts of undaunting courage under fire in 1965 continue to inspire our nation today. God, may Colonel Davis's place in the halls of heroes serve as a living testament to the warrior spirit as we memorialize his service, a service characterized by tenacity and enduring commitment to the soldiers under his leadership. Colonel Davis, embodied the warrior ethos, refusing to leave his comrades on the battlefield. And we gather here today to honor him for being a great member of the Army family and a great American. In this hallowed space, 
we are privileged to add Colonel Davis's name to the honored roll of America's greatest heroes. As we do so, we ask that you continue to bless our Army and our nation with men and women of character, tenacity, determination, and courage. And may your hand of favor remain upon the Davis family as they too seek to live up to Colonel Davis's legacy. And now of everlasting God, may the living flame of freedom continue to burn brightly forth in this nation as a beacon of hope to the oppressed and as a terrible warning to the oppressor. And may your spirit continue to empower our soldiers our civilians, our army family members, here and overseas, as they sustain our army's ability to deploy, fight, and win our nation's wars. Army strong, people first, winning matters. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief of Staff of the Army. Well, good afternoon. You know, every day is a great day to be in the United States Army because we serve with the world's greatest soldiers. And today is an especially great day because we honor one of our greatest soldiers, Colonel Paris Davis. Secretary Hitz, Secretary Warmoth, Sergeant Major Grinston, Chief Dixon Carter, fellow senior military and civilian leaders, distinguished guests, which you all are, thank you for being here today. And we are honored to, to have two great Americans and me members of the Hall of Heroes here to welcome Colonel Davis, Lieutenant Colonel Will Swenson. Will, where you at? Right, right there, okay. How about a hand for Will and then And my son, Leroy Petrie, Petrie, please stand up and recognize these great Americans. We also have Mr. Ron Dice, who served with Colonel Davis in Vietnam. Ron, where you at? Right there, hand for Ron. And we are especially honored to have the family of Colonel Davis here, his daughter Stephanie, his daughter Reagan, and her husband Dale, and their sons Mason and Keaton, and it's great to have you all here. What a wonderful family, and thank you for your support. Uh, give them a hand. And I know there are many other special family members, friends, and fellow soldiers here. And you know, one thing, we, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to our Vietnam veterans. So if you are a Vietnam veteran, could you please stand up so we can recognize your service? Please stand up. I know there's some, some of you out here. How about a hand for our Vietnam veterans? How about a hand for our Vietnam veterans? How about a hand for our Vietnam veterans? All right. I'd also like to recognize our Gold Star families. We have the family of Specialist Four, Robert Brown here today, his wife Paula and son Troy. Could you please stand and be recognized? We will always remember and honor your sacrifices. And today is a special day for our Army because we honor, honor and celebrate Colonel Paris Davis as we induct him into the Hall of heroes. It's a special place reserved for only those who have demonstrated conspicuous gallantry above the call of duty and under extraordinary circumstances. This recognition is long overdue to a remarkable combat leader, but it's never too late to do the right thing, and this is the right thing. And I can also tell you there's absolutely no question that he is truly deserving of our highest honor and respect. Sir, we are proud to call you a fellow soldier.
You know, there are some people who look for their heroes in golf courses, in theater halls, in sports arenas. But my heroes are soldiers. Soldiers who raised their right hand and said, send me. Soldiers like Colonel Davis, who repeatedly went above and beyond the call of duty to risk his own life for the protection of others. Leading into that fateful day on 18 June 1965, then Captain Davis had a force of three other Green Berets and a newly trained company of South Vietnamese Regional Force soldiers. He moved his men through the darkness of midnight and early morning for a surprise attack on the North Vietnamese forces. During the movement, Captain Davis found and captured two enemy soldiers and interrogated them to find out they were facing a battalion size of well-trained and armed fighters. And as the assault force approached the enemy near dawn, they were spotted. The sound of the enemy bugle call and then heavy gunfire shattered the morning silence and bullets rained, rained down onto Captain Davis and his men. They skillfully maneuvered and fought through a barrage of gunfire to destroy the North Vietnamese forces firing from small buildings and fighting positions. And what followed were hours of a grueling battle for Captain Davis, his Green Beret teammates, and Vietnamese soldiers. Hours of Captain Davis calling in fire missions in order to suppress the enemy and allowing him to move through intense enemy machine gun fire to recover his men that were pinned down and wounded. Captain Davis alone ran three times from his position through rel relentless gunfire to Master Sergeant Billy War, who was stuck in a rice paddy and shot multiple times in his legs and foot. And during his movements, Captain Davis recovered, received multiple gunshot wounds, but he never wavered to get Master Sergeant War to safety and evacuated. Captain Davis continued to call in artillery. With multiple wounds already battering his body, he charged through withering fire with fierce determination to get Staff Sergeant Morgan. Captain Davis pulled Staff Sergeant Morgan free from a trench of human waste and carried him to safety where they continued to fight on. During the ongoing battle, another Green Beret, Sergeant First Class Reinberg, arrived with an ammo resupply, but he was shortly hit in the chest about 400 meters away. Again, Captain Davis charged through an assault of gunfire to get him and get him evacuated. Hours later, Camp Davis finally found Specialist Brown, the team medic. Sergeant Morgan provided covering fire so that Camp Davis could, could crawl to Specialist Brown, who was severely wounded and brought him back to Medevac. Never leave a fallen comrade. It's part of our warrior ethos and the Special Forces Creed. It's part of who Colonel Davis is. No matter what his own injuries were, and no matter how intense the enemy bared down on them, Colonel Davis risked his life time and time again to get his men and his teammates to safety. He never left the battlefield until all his soldiers were accounted for. His character, his commitment, his competency, his care for soldiers, and most of all, his courage that day demonstrated that he is an incredible leader and exceptional in every way. He truly cared about his soldiers, both U.S. and Vietnamese. He led by example and never told his soldiers to do something he wouldn't do himself. He shared in all of their duties, some of the worst duties. And I am told the only thing they wouldn't let him do was cook. <laughs> so, sir, you know, and, and I got I to share this because we did discuss this. And I, and I was going to say they weren't big fans of your cooking. But he said they also had a pet monkey, and the monkey wouldn't eat your food either. So I don't know what to say about that. But, you know, that was a, a special, tight, and cohesive team that they had, and it started from the leadership. Every member of the team had a voice, and every member of the team matted. And although Colonel Davis earned many awards, and they all tell a story of extraordinary bravery, and all his actions were wrote to us, they were routine for him. You know, sir, your actions inspire us, and they will continue to inspire future generations of Americans. All of us here today, and all of our soldiers serving today, will strive to honor your legacy. You represent the very best of the Army. You represent 
the very best of America, then and now. Sir, thank you for your incredible leadership and courage. God bless you and your family. Proud to serve with you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of the Army. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our distinguished guests, our friends and families. Deputy Secretary Hicks, uh, Vice Chairman Grady, thank you for being with us here today. General McConville, thank you for the leadership of our Army and for welcoming all of the very distinguished guests that we have with us today, and for sharing with everyone here the truly riveting story of that fateful day of Colonel Davis's tremendous leadership, courage, and valor. As President Biden said of Colonel Davis last Friday, you are everything we all aspire to be. You are everything our nation is at our best, brave and big-hearted, determined and devoted, selfless and steadfast American. Colonel Davis is surely a remarkable soldier. His fellow Green Berets described him as brave, honest, courageous, and exceedingly humble. He raised his hand to do the hard things, the almost impossible things, and he did so without hesitation. He did what it took to get his teammates out of harm's way. His battle buddy, Mr. Ron Dice, who we're delighted to have with us here today, recalled one particular battle where enemy forces shot Colonel Davis's M16 right out of his hands, but he kept fighting anyway and he led his men to safety. He did all of this time and again without fanfare or expectation of recognition. When asked about his actions during key moments of the battles in Vietnam, without fail, Colonel Davis demurs and says simply, he did what had to be done. But very few of us in this room can truly know what it takes to have that kind of courage, the kind of courage to do what needs to be done and to do it repeatedly over 20 long hours as Colonel Davis did that day so long ago in June 1965. For anyone here who's had the opportunity to talk to Colonel Davis about his heroic actions at Bong Song, you know that he is very reluctant to take credit, and he's maybe even slightly embarrassed that you even brought it up. While he may prefer to not say very much about his heroic actions in Vietnam, he does have a preference, I'm told, about his first name. Colonel Paris Davis is named after his great uncle, Paris Davis I. He's not 100% sure what inspired his great grandparents to choose that name. Perhaps it was the famous City of Lights, but Colonel Davis prefers to think it was the character in Greek mythology who started the Trojan War. Not because he was an ambitious conqueror, mind you, but rather something of a ladies' man. <laughs> who stole away the beautiful Helen of Troy. Either way, it's a remarkable name for a remarkable man, and one he now shares with his son, Paris Davis III. In all seriousness, what's clear is that a soldier in the United States Army, Colonel Davis found a calling, a passion, and a place he could call home. He was passionate about the profession of arms, and he excelled as an officer. But the Army wasn't simply a job for Colonel Davis. It was his home, and he found community in the Special Forces. As a Green Beret, his soldiers, his fellow Americans, whatever their race, were kin to him. Fourteen years after President Truman desegregated the military, there was still discrimination in the ranks and in the Green Berets. But as Colonel Davis says himself, thinking back to his time in the Vietnam War, Soldiers forget about race when they're fighting together. Then Captain Davis was the kind of leader that ensured when his soldiers looked to their left or to their right, they looked past the color of each other's skins and just had each other's backs in battle. That he could and would be an effective leader was not a given so many years ago. As one of the first black Special Forces officers, 
Some wondered whether he could successfully command white troops. And as has so often been the case, he would be held to a higher standard than those around him and he would have to work twice as hard. But he measured up and more and his soldiers had faith in him. When asked why he disobeyed orders that day in June 1965 to go back and get his men, Davis says, you must have as much courage to go and get them out as you have courage to send them to war. His teammates knew that he felt this way and it reinforced their faith in him. Not only a remarkable leader and soldier, Colonel Davis is also remarkable in his ability to lift up the voices of others. As a young captain, he learned the importance of creating an environment where soldiers could speak their minds. Davis believed that if his team felt heard, they would feel ownership in the mission and invest themselves in it. And he held this belief not just when it was easy, but when it was awkward. One day, Captain Davis was selected to brief the Secretary of Defense himself, Robert McNamara, who was visiting troops in Vietnam. Davis had just finished the mission brief, and the quietest member of his team, Specialist Brown, chose that precise moment to speak up out of nowhere and to say, and I'm paraphrasing here, I'm pretty sure, sir, that was messed up. <laughs> now, instead of putting Specialist Brown on KP duty for a week, Davis decided to focus on the fact that Specialist Brown cared enough to speak up. Davis believed that every person should have the opportunity Based on that, where he heard many stories of his fellow soldiers, he decided that when he left the Army, he would pour his time and talent into lifting up the voices of others. Colonel Davis decided to build a new community outside of the one he knew and loved in the Army. So he founded the Metro Herald, a newspaper just down the road in Alexandria, Virginia. The Metro Herald gave Colonel Davis a platform for his astute observations and the ability to tell the stories of others. Grounded in the belief that everyone has a story and a viewpoint, the Metro Herald took on the mission of educating and sharing the accomplishments of his community. This was a mission that he worked on for over, over 20 years before finally retiring to have a little more time with his family. And speaking of his family, Colonel Paris Davis has been a remarkable father to his children, Stephanie, Paris, and Reagan, and a remarkable poppy to his grandchildren, Jen, Lauren, Mason, and Keaton. Reagan shared that she learned early and often from her dad the importance of finding the will to be better when confronted with injustice. As she and her siblings confronted challenges in school and in life, their dad was there for them, and he made sure that his kids knew how to stand up, be brave, and hold their heads high. Whether in the classroom growing up or now in their professional lives, the Davis children embrace the importance of being uniters, not focusing on the I, but focusing on the we. Reagan is incredibly and understandably proud of her remarkable father. She tells her own children to channel their poppy's courage in moments of difficulty. She says, life isn't always fair, but you have to find the fairness in life. And you have to have the will to make things better. I know that for the entire Davis family, the journey to receive the Medal of Honor has not been a smooth one. But I'm encouraged by the words of Martin Luther King Jr that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Since 2017, the Congress and the executive branch have mandated a series of reviews of veterans of color and religious minorities who were awarded honors during multiple conflicts to ensure that their acts of valor were appropriately recognized without bias or prejudice. Our system isn't perfect, but we are working to make it better every day. Today is overdue, but I am so very happy that today is finally here. Colonel Davis, you are a remarkable leader, a remarkable man, and a remarkable American soldier. On behalf of a grateful nation and our Army, thank you.
gentlemen, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Right, thank you and good afternoon. It is my extreme privilege to be here today to honor Colonel Paris Davis, a Vietnam War veteran, a combat hero, and now a Medal of Honor recipient. Secretary Wormuth and General McConville, thank you for your leadership of the Army and for your tributes to Colonel Davis and your accounts of his sacrifice and service. Let me also recognize several of the distinguished guests here today, including, of course, our Medal of Honor recipients, Lieutenant Colonel William Swenson and Sergeant First Class Leroy Perry, and the number of senior leaders across the Department of Defense who have come out today to share in the uh, honor. I also want to welcome Colonel Davis's longtime friend and battle buddy, uh, Mr. Ron Dice, members of the Davis family, all of whom are joining us today. We all owe our deepest gratitude and respect to our nation's military families, families like the Davises. It should never be overlooked nor underappreciated how critical your support and sacrifice are to the defense of this nation. Thank you all, in fact, for being here today to celebrate an extraordinary American soldier. That soldier, our Medal of Honor recipient, Colonel Davis, is, as President Biden so aptly remarked at Friday's Medal of Honor ceremony, an incredible man. And I want to acknowledge that this honor is long overdue. I want to acknowledge that for you and for your family, Colonel Davis. An appropriate recognition should have come much sooner, following the bravery you demonstrated and the sacrifices you made more than half a century ago to save your fellow soldiers from certain death during the Vietnam War. Everyone in this auditorium can agree that this award, which you so richly deserve, has in fact been a long time coming. The Medal of Honor is awarded to those individuals who face stare down, seemingly insurmountable odds on the battlefield. Those who sacrifice their own health and safety to defend the nation and their comrades, and those who show exceptional valor. Any who have heard of Colonel Davis's fearlessness and bold spirit understand exactly why he deserves a ceremony fit for a hero. On May 25, 1961, President John Kennedy delivered a special message to Congress on urgent national needs. Inspired by President Kennedy's call to increase and reorient our special forces, Paris Davis became one of the first black members of the Green Berets. So it was that Davis was an Army captain on June 18, 1965, leading a unit of several American soldiers and about 90 freshly minted Vietnamese soldiers at Camp Bong Son, Binh Dinh Province in the Republic of Vietnam. Then Captain Davis's unit had conducted a successful ambush on the camp, and the North Vietnamese began an overwhelming counterattack almost immediately. From sunrise until after sunset, Davis led his combined forces in a fierce battle, defending their position against several hundred Viet Cong attackers. Captain Davis showed no fear, running right into the face of danger, meeting five Viet Cong coming over his unit's trench line, killing them all. Hearing fire from another direction, he again raced toward known danger and launched a grenade killing four more Viet Cong. In spite of a jammed M16, a blasted trigger finger, and the raining down of sniper fire, Captain Davis used what he had, whether it was his pistol and his pinky, the butt of his rifle, or his pure will to defend himself at any given moment. And he was still under sniper fire when he began looking for his teammates. First, he went off for Staff Sergeant David Morgan, who was stuck and yelling out from a ditch. Locating the sniper, Captain Davis killed him with a sniper's own rifle and unlocked a grenade, killing two more Viet Cong nearby. He then threw Staff Sergeant Morgan a rope and pulled him out of the muddy trough. Next, Captain Davis turned to Master Sergeant Billy Waugh, wounded, shot four times in the foot, and stuck in mud and vegetation. While pulling Master Sergeant Waugh out of the muck, the enemy again tried to overrun their position. 
Davis picked up a machine gun and started firing, sending enemy soldiers dropping to the ground or scrambling to escape. After rescuing Master Sergeant Waugh, Davis held off yet another Viet Cong assault with a machine gun and then turned to help First Sergeant First Class John Reinberg, who had been shot twice in the chest. He retrieved Sergeant Reinberg and carried him across his shoulders 400 meters through the muddy rice field. When support arrived, Captain Davis was ordered to withdraw from the position to seek medical help. But with Specialist Rob Brown still out there, he simply and outright refused. Specialist Brown's fate weighed especially heavily. The night before the battle, Captain Davis and his teammates had popped open a box of cigars to celebrate the birth of Rob's first child. With the celebration fresh in his mind, Captain Davis was determined to get Rob back to his wife, Paula, and his newborn son, Troy. So, using a few choice words over his handset, Captain Davis told the air controller that he would not leave until everyone was recovered and safe, that no one would be left behind, and he did not back down from his word. By the end of that day, Captain Davis had saved four of his fellow American soldiers, one by one, and while twice refusing commands to evacuate the battlefield and suffering from his own serious wounds and injuries. I believe I ask this question on behalf of everyone in this room and everyone who has heard Colonel Davis's story and eyewitness accounts, and that question is, how? How does one run towards surefire danger with such abandon? How does one push through under such daunting and dire circumstances to keep themselves and their fellow soldiers alive? And how does one remain as humble and modest as Colonel Davis, despite all he has done and all that he has been through? In fact, it is my understanding that, Reagan, it wasn't until 2019 that you became aware of the extent of your father's heroic deeds during his military service. I don't believe there is a single work of fiction, no Marvel movie ever filmed, that can capture the heroism that Captain Davis displayed that day. This is the medal of real life heroes, and Colonel Davis's valor is exemplary. Incredible strength, a brilliant strategic mind, and uncommon bravery against overwhelmingly, seemingly insurmountable odds. And Colonel Davis tells us what motivated him against those staggering odds, what has motivated so many of the men and women across our total force and throughout generations. It is the simple desire to be of service, to serve one's community, to serve one's comrades, and to serve one's country. And I believe that's why, as Colonel Davis likes to say, he kept on keeping on, not backing down or giving up or losing hope. He chose to act and to lead. After his military service and having endured the unfathomable heat of battle, Colonel Davis could have returned home and assumed a private life, turning inward. But instead, he continued to make America better by making his community better, supporting his family, and launching and publishing the Metro Herald newspaper for 30 years. We should all be inspired by Colonel Davis's example, and we are grateful to his friends, his teammates, and the many volunteers who over the decades were so inspired by his actions that they remained steadfast in ensuring Colonel Davis received the nation's highest combat honor, a recognition of which he is undeniably worthy. This year, the United States is marking an important milestone, the 75th anniversary of the racial integration of the armed forces. With it came resistance, but also the opportunity for full equality. So as I close, I want to state the obvious. Colonel Davis is living proof that we are a stronger, more effective military by drawing on the talents of qualified Americans of every race who want to answer the call to military service. And today, I am proud to help lead a Defense Department helmed by the first African-American Secretary of Defense, a department that continues to expand opportunity to qualified Americans, regardless of race or gender or identity, and a department that understands that honor has no expiration date. So on behalf of a grateful nation, 
thank you, Colonel Davis, for your courage under fire, for your continued commitment to community, and for your outstanding service to this nation. It is our incredible honor to add your name to those inscribed in the Hall of Heroes. Secretary Warmouth, General McConville, Sergeant Major Grinston, Colonel Paris D. Davis, and Ms. Reagan Hopper will now join Dr. Hicks on stage for the induction ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated during the presentations. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3rd, 1863, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Captain Paris D. Davis, United States Army. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Captain Paris D. Davis, Commander, Detachment Alpha 321, 5th Special Forces Group Airborne, 1st Special Forces, distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty while serving as an advisor to the 883rd Regional Force Company, Army of the Republic of Vietnam, during combat operations against an armed enemy in the vicinity of Bong Son, Republic of Vietnam, on June 17th and 18th, 1965. Captain Davis and three other United States Special Forces advisors accompanied the Vietnamese 883rd Regional Force Company on its first combat mission, a daring nighttime raid against the Viet Cong Regional Headquarters, housing a superior enemy force. Captain Davis's advice and leadership allowed the company to gain the tactical advantage, allowing it to surprise the unsuspecting enemy force and kill approximately 100 enemy soldiers. While returning from the successful raid, the regional force company was ambushed and sustained several casualties. Captain Davis constantly exposed himself to hostile small arms fire to rally the inexperienced and disorganized company. He expertly directed both artillery and small arms fire, enabling other elements of the company to reach his position. Although wounded in the leg, he aided in the evacuation of other wounded men of his unit, but refused medical evacuation himself. Following the arrival of air support, Captain Davis directed artillery fire within 30 meters of his own position in an attempt to halt the enemy's advance. Then, with complete disregard for his own life, he braved intense enemy fire to cross an open field to rescue his seriously wounded and immobilized team sergeant. While carrying the sergeant up a hill to a position of relative safety, Captain Davis was again wounded by enemy fire. Despite two painful wounds, Captain Davis again refused medical evacuation, remained with the troops, fought bravely, and provided pivotal leadership and inspiration to the regional force company as they repelled several Viet Cong assaults on their position over a period of several hours. When friendly reinforcements finally arrived, Captain Davis again refused medical evacuation until he had recovered a U.S. advisor under his command who had been wounded during the initial ambush and presumed dead. While personally recovering the wounded soldier, he found him severely wounded but still clinging to life. Captain Davis directed the helicopter extraction of his wounded colleague, not leaving the battlefield himself until after all friendly forces were recovered or medically evacuated. Captain Davis's heroism and selflessness above and beyond the call of duty at the risk of his own life are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army.
At this time, the Medal of Honor flag will be presented. On the 23rd of October, 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedoms and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon. The Medal of Honor plaque will now be unveiled, inducting Colonel Paris D. Davis into the Hall of Heroes. Thank you, Colonel Davis, Deputy Secretary Hicks, Secretary Warmoth, General McConville, and Sergeant Major Grinston. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Reagan Hopper. Hello. I am pleased to say my dad has had an extraordinary week and enjoyed every moment. But after a solid couple of weeks of talking to the media, shaking hands, which he loves to do, and chatting up a storm with his friends and their families, he just needed a break. He insisted, though, that we flip a coin to see who would give his speech. <laughs> I tricked him just a little bit, and I won. So it is my absolute pleasure to give the following remarks on behalf of my father, Colonel Paris Davis. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, especially my battle brother, Ron Dice and his wife, and the family of Robert Brown, a remarkable soldier and medic who we lost to battle injuries, and Billy Waugh, who could not be here today, but who is here with us in spirit. I'm so honored to be with all of you on this beautiful afternoon. On Friday at the White House, President Biden was very gracious to me and inspiring in his comments about the Medal of Honor. I would like to thank him again and thank Secretary Austin and Secretary Warmoth for their kind words and for their momentous decisions to authorize this award. We also want to thank Deputy Secretary Hicks for hosting us today and certainly General McConville for your support and kind remarks, and for all of you who are here with us today. Last, General Pyatt, <laughs> thank you for the warm welcome and being with us all week through the Medal, oh, there. <laughs> Medal of Honor ceremonies. This is in my father's words. In 1965, it was such a long time ago, but I remember the most was that we knew the fight would be tough and the enemy was all around us. I'm so proud of the 100 South Vietnamese soldiers who fought with us. Collectively, we never accepted defeat, nor did we let our guard down. The enemy forces outnumbered us, but we never went into combat for any other reason than to win. During the 19 hours of that battle, I knew I had to stay positive and take care of my men. Looking back, I can hardly remember the sting of the grenade, the wounds to my hand, forearm, leg, and face. I do remember, though, that so many others 
suffered more. When I think of my tour in Vietnam, I often remember the South Vietnamese people and living among them. They were such good people. We knew that because we cooperated with them and made sure both the soldiers and their families welcomed into our camp, were welcomed. These experiences impacted me and my view about the importance of service, dedication, and teamwork. Then and now, I am so proud to be an American soldier and a Green Beret. I am grateful for what the Army provided me and what America has given me, opportunity, purpose, and pride. If I were to offer advice to any young people today, it would be this. Read about and try to better understand the lives of others and the opportunities life will give you. Be a learner. The Medal of Honor recognition is quite overwhelming, but it reminds me that with cooperation, all things are possible. With teamwork, service, and dedication that I mentioned moments ago. My hope is that Americans and the members of the armed forces will take a moment to reflect. And I hope you will find a way to serve and help your community and our country. I challenge you to realize your dreams for yourself and for America. Dad, would you please stand? Just stand. Mm -hmm. In closing, in closing, please know I am so grateful to be an American, an American soldier for life, and forever a Green Beret. Thank you, and God bless you all, and God bless America. Thank you, Miss Hopper. Ladies and gentlemen, remain standing and join in the singing of the Army song. The words to the Army song can be found in your program. March along, sing her song with the army of the free. Count the brave, count the true, who have fought to victory. We're the army and proud of our name. We're the army and proudly proclaim. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might. And the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done, fighting till the battle's won, and the army goes rolling along. And it's high, high, hey, the army's on its way. Count off the cadence loud and strong, for where'er we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along. This concludes the Medal of Honor induction ceremony. Please stand for the departure of the official party.